On the Spot with Michelle McCorry is brought to you by Swan Bitcoin. Hello, I'm Michelle McCorry. Thank you for joining us. With only just over two months left in the year, Bitcoin is trading up more than 100% year to date. Gold is up around 8.7%, the S&P 500 up around 9.2%, the Nasdaq at 23% and the Dow is flat. Meanwhile, the focus is very much on the Fed and what we can expect from next week's meeting as 10-year Treasury yields recently hit over 5% for the first time in 16 years. Escalating geopolitical tension in the Middle East also a factor for the markets. And on the upside, there is slightly less dysfunction in Washington, D.C., with Representative Mike Johnson of Louisiana just being elected Speaker of the House. All right, well, here to help us digest and analyze all of this and more and give us his trading guidance is Kitco fan favorite Gareth Soloway. Gareth is the chief market strategist at InTheMoneyStocks.com and president of VerifiedInvesting.com. Gareth, always good to have you. Welcome back. Hey, thank you so much for having me back, Michelle. All right. A lot of ground to cover. Obviously, a very big focus on Bitcoin and the moves we're seeing there. We also have some second quarter earnings to digest. But I want to start off with a big macro picture and what we're seeing in the Treasury market. You had recently said that if Treasuries hit and hold over the 5% yield, that is a very, very big deal. And we did recently see the 10-year surge past the 5% mark for the first time since 2007. 30-year bonds similarly spiked at approximately 5.2%. There has been a slight pullback to just below that level. Some interesting comments from billionaire investor Bill Ackman saying he was ending his bearish bet on long-term treasuries. He posted on X that remaining short bonds at the current long-term rates was too risky due to growing geopolitical risks. Uh, he had earlier disclosed that he was shorting the 30-year treasury in August. So, Gareth, keeping in mind that yields move opposite to price, so high yield means low price, help us understand, firstly, the significance of the 10-year treasury yield surpassing that 5% threshold. Yeah, so so that's the big thing, right? It's a very psychological level, that 5% level on the 10-year. And we did go just above it briefly, and then Bill Ackman did make that tweet saying he was covering his bond short. So remember, folks, that when yields go higher, bonds bond prices go lower, and that's the big deal here. So he's seeing what I'm seeing, and there's really no way that the yields can stay above 5% for a significant amount of time, because if they do go above 5%, there will be something that breaks in the system. You will see a meteoric collapse in the financial system, which will then by default cause the Fed to have to lower interest rates very, very quickly. So that's where we are right now. 5% just under. The markets are skittish here. We're seeing again stocks selling off tremendously today as yields are pushing back towards 5%. But that 5% level is very, very important to the psychology of the market. Why? Why is 5% so important, Gareth? Well, it, it really denotes a key level, right? 5% in people's mind, that even number of 5%, and again, how it plays out. And remember, look at the debt of the US, $33.5 trillion. Think about the higher these yields go, the, the higher for longer, which is now finally being recognized by the market. Even though Jerome Powell told us that for a long period of time, we were going to see higher for longer, we're now starting to live it. We're starting to believe it in the stock market. And so you have the debt there, you have credit card debt at all-time highs, and, and credit card card interest rates have now gone from 12 to 13 percent to north of 25 percent. So the consumer is being tapped, the government and our debt is being being uh, you know kind of put in a position where it's unsustainable. And then you have this kind of push where yields going up will eventually cause the banks to collapse. And by the way, you don't have to go any further than looking at the chart. In fact, let's bring up a chart here. Look at Bank of America, folks. The Bank of America chart has broken major technical support. We have this low going back to March of 2020, right through these lows, and look at where we're trading, basically at 52-week lows on Bank of America. This goes along with most of the banks, and what we know is that these banks are now suffering dr dramatically with the commercial real estate issues. Real estate in general, residential, is now starting to collapse. It's the beginning of the end of this bull, bull run we've seen in real estate. Right, and let's not forget, earlier this year, two of the three largest bank failures in U.S. history due to that aggressive Fed posturing. You know, you said higher for longer, and it's interesting because Bill Gross of PIMCO wrote, 
Hire for longer is yesterday's mantra. He's, of course, the former chief investment officer of Pacific Investment Management Company, or PIMCO. And he urged his followers on X to invest in the curve on bonds, which, as we just said, have been hit with a sell-off in recent months. He's also expecting we'll be in a recession by the fourth quarter. What's your read there, Gareth? Yeah, I, I totally agree. I think I think you look at the economy right now, and you could argue that half the population has already been in a recession. You look at those that didn't have investments, they didn't get the results of a massive move up in the stock market since the lows. And ultimately, what we are seeing now is that those people have been suffering. There's a huge divergence in consumer confidence between the wealthy and the middle to lower income. And that is now going to catch up to the wealthy income players. Those that had investments, we're now seeing the stock market roll over, that will take away the wealth effect and it will make everyone feel the pressure of a recession. So are you saying negative GDP by the fourth quarter, that the fourth quarter reading comes in when it's done at a negative GDP number? Yeah, it's, it's tricky to know if that those reads will come in, in in the fourth quarter or if it will be in the first quarter of 2024. But inevitably, we will all know that we're in a recession by the first quarter of 2024. Okay, so between what the 10-year Treasury is telling us, what we're hearing from Bill Gross and uh, Bill Ackman, what does that mean for the Fed's moves? And what does Gareth think we're going to see from Fed Chair Jerome Powell at next week's meeting and beyond? Yeah, so I think they'll pause next week. Uh, there's no doubt about that. They see the stress that's being gone that's gone on. In fact, yields running up to 5% on the 10-year has actually done a lot of the work for the Federal Reserve that the Fed might have wanted to do. In fact, you could argue maybe it even pushed it a little too far. Now, they see the underbelly of this market. You mentioned the bank failures earlier this year in March, Silicon Valley Bank. That was when yields on the 10-year were at, at 4%. We're now at 5%. The only reason we haven't seen more bank failures is simply that they essentially the government, the FDIC insured deposits because they bailed out depositors at those banks. Everyone assumes they'll bail out every depositor, and therefore you're not seeing the bank runs that would cause these collapses. But I would argue that a lot of these banks have so much dead paper on their balance sheet. It doesn't have to be marked to market, but they're essentially zombie banks now. Right. Um, and other factors to consider now into the mix, you know, other than that, I mean, we've also got inflation, which has been persistently stubborn, regardless of what the narrative seems to be. Uh, we're also going to talk about oil a little bit later on and what that could mean for inflation if we see a surge in oil prices on, on geopolitical tensions. But before we get into that, Gareth, how are equity markets starting to process this? Are they starting to price this in? We do have the NASDAQ, <clears throat> excuse me, on the verge of trading below uh, it's 200 uh, day average. It's down, I think, about two and a half percent for the first time since March. And a close below that level suggests a downtrend. Break down what the charts are telling us about the NASDAQ. Yeah, so the NASDAQ, you're right. The NASDAQ had a nasty day to day down 2.5%. If you look at the chart here, what we see is that we're at the low end of this kind of wedge pattern or channel. So we're just peaking below this trend line here. Now, if this breaks and we see continuation tomorrow, to me, what this tells me is that we are going to see a bigger drop. And ultimately, if we zoom out on the chart, and let's flip over to the weekly chart, we're going to go to this trend line down here on the NASDAQ 100. This is below 300. We're talking about a 50. 15% decline if this level gets broken. And that's going to be a big one that probably takes us into early 2024. But we will see a whole different environment, an environment where asset prices overall are continuing to sell off. Gold continues to shine. And Bitcoin is kind of up in the air right now. I mean, that's the crazy thing. Bitcoin's had an amazing run, but can it withstand an asset sell-off in the NASDAQ of 15 to 20%? Oh, and we will get to that in your very specific calls on Bitcoin and gold. But let's just stick with the market at large here for a little bit more, Gareth, because the thinking was that the market was looking forward to a Fed pivot, right? That yeah. that would be bullish for, for the markets. Now it looks as though the Fed is pausing, as we said, indications that it can't go any further. The markets aren't digesting that in, in a positive way anymore. It certainly doesn't appear that way. Yeah, and there's there's two sides to that. So number one, it's that the Fed is now saying higher for longer. So it's not like all of a sudden the market is going to get its wish of instantly lower interest rates. The market is now realizing because inflation is staying elevated, the Fed cannot cut dramatically. They might do some sort of thing if we 
collapse on the NASDAQ, let's say 10% from here, they might do what I would call a mercy cut, which is just one cut to throw the market a bone, but they can't drop the market or can't drop interest rates significantly due to the fact that inflation is still north of 3%. And I think that's the kicker here to, to recognize that you have inflation at levels that if they were to drop interest rates dramatically, you're going to send inflation through the roof to probably north of 10%. And the Fed, again, does not want to do that. So that's the kicker here on the inflation side. So even if we start to see real signs of this recession kicking in fourth quarter, first quarter, you still don't think that the Fed will be aggressive in any rate cutting? Not aggressive. Not aggressive unless we see those inflation numbers come down dramatically. I think that's the only chance that we have of getting aggressive to, uh, you know, action from the Federal Reserve. So a pause and then perhaps a mercy cut, as you yeah. call it, of 25 bips. All right, let's go over some of the recent uh, earnings that we got. Uh, we'll focus on the tech stocks because um, you had some very interesting swing trade calls on some of those companies. And let's kick it off with Alphabet, formerly known as Google. I still think of it as Google. Um, taking a big hit today, about 10% in late day trading, even though Alphabet beat Wall Street expectations for both revenue and earnings per share, it did hit on cloud revenue. Uh, break down what we saw there and what your, your swing trade move is on Microsoft now. Yeah, so so Google, right? We have Google up, but I'm going to bring up Microsoft. Now, the key on Microsoft. I'm sorry, Alphabet, rather. Alphabet, rather. Yes, go, go ahead. Through. All right, no problem. So, so if we take a look at the Google chart, what we saw is down, like you said, about 10%. And number one, this is a trillion dollar plus company. So 10% decline is massive. And that explains why the NASDAQ took such a big hit today, even though Microsoft was actually up a little bit on earnings. Now, looking at the chart, it was short term overbought. It mimics, honestly, the chart pattern is very similar to the NASDAQ 100. The highs were put in late in 2021, the big collapse into the October lows. And here we have a lower high. On the chart, you have downside probably to about 122. There will be some support at 122. But I would say that overall, those are short-term bounce levels, this one and then 112. You're probably just like I expect the NASDAQ heading towards the $100 even number on Alphabet. So, or And again, the, the key here is just to understand this is that the markets, if I'm correct, and we do go into a recession, you're going to see advertising cutbacks. You're going to see all the things that have helped Alphabet make this multi trillion dollar valuation, they're going to start to suffer. And I think that's, by the way, going back to why the markets are not loving the idea of the Fed pausing. This is why, because the market is starting to see the tea leaves. You are going to have a recession, which means lower earnings and therefore multiples have to come down. Right. I mean, we used to have the sentiment that bad news was good news in terms of what we can expect from the Fed, but it seems like that reality is starting to shift now. That's right. Absolutely. hundred percent. All right. So talk us through uh, a little bit more on, on Microsoft, because uh, it did do very well, posted 13 percent year on year sales growth, also beating expectations. Well, what's the move going forward in terms of a short term trading perspective on Microsoft? Yeah, so Microsoft was was one of the few to be up today on the back of earnings. And I think we just got meta out. We can take a look at that in just a second. But ultimately, again, the little bit of a gain today didn't offset what meta, what Google or Alphabet said. And so you had a little bit of an update about 3%. Normally, 3% on Microsoft is a great day, but not when you saw other companies getting crushed. And I would just draw your attention to Amazon. Look at Amazon today. Amazon broke key support down 5.5%. And again, that's queuing off the fear that the Google slash alphabet earnings are going to translate into worse earnings for a lot of these big cap tech names. And now I don't have major support on Amazon, for instance, until $115. And just lastly, let's just take a quick check at um, Meta slash uh, Meta platforms or Facebook. And right after hours, we are seeing a small dip, not much, but a small dip as well here. So the earnings picture, this might be a little bit of a, a wake up call for investors that even though we're not in a recession, you're starting to see the CEOs warn that things will be slowing. We're seeing a lot of these earnings CEOs say, hey, listen, yes, this quarter was solid, but next quarter we're expecting lower earnings. So going into this year, the conventional wisdom, Gareth, was that we would see a very, very big sell-off in the markets that has not materialized as yet, not even close as we just ran through the numbers. NASDAQ still up over 20% year to date. At what point does that happen? Do you still see that happening? And, and by what big a move? 
Yeah, I definitely see it happening. I think I think I underestimated, you know, going into this year, I thought maybe first half would be solid and we'd sell off more in the second half. It's really now coming into the sell off being in the late third quarter to the fourth quarter. But I think the key was underestimating how much money was still in the system from COVID. People had saved so much. They were willing to run up credit card debt to unforeseen levels to kind of sustain their lifestyle. And that really has kept the markets doing well. We're now seeing that narrative crack. And I think that's where we will head down. And I fully expect in the next couple of years, and maybe even next year, we will take out these October lows and we will head to this level on the SPY. This is the long-term trend line going back to 2009. It's all the way down at around 275 to 280 on the SPY. And just to put it in perspective, we're at 417 right now. Now, the key is this, and this is going to be mind-blowing for a lot of you, is if you take a trend line from the lows of 09, remember in lows of 09, it was the federal Federal Reserve beginning to print money. That was QE. And they did all the QE all the way up. And what's crazy is that with COVID, we got this supercharged rally. So even if we sold off down to that longer term trend line, we're only coming back to where the Fed was doing their QE. That's the trend. That's the longer term trend of normal QE, not the kind of steroid push that we saw during COVID. So it wouldn't even be that crazy to see a reversal like that in the stock market. And again, that would be really hurtful to to investors. And I know that, but that's the reality of the situation. What is that in percentage terms? What would that be? How significant a drop, more or less? I'll make you do the math very quickly rather no than me. No problem. So if we just, luckily, TradingView has a great uh, tool here. That would be a 35% decline. So 35% from current levels approximately would take us down to those levels. Right. Okay. Of course, that would also potentially have ramifications for Bitcoin if there is an overall market sell-off. We'll get your thoughts on that, but let's focus on what we've been seeing from Bitcoin right now. And as we mentioned, up 107% year-to-date, Bitcoin has been flirting with that $35,000 level. Most of this price action driven by positive signals and reports of a spot Bitcoin ETF being approved soon. Safe to say that that's what's been driving this. Yeah, that's absolutely what's been driving it. And what we really saw was when we had that fake news that hit about the approval where Bitcoin jumped from about 27,000 all the way to a high of 30,000, what that made people recognize is that there's going to be significant upside when the spot ETF gets approved. And so what we saw was we saw a lot of short covering and a lot of buyers coming into the market. And essentially what we're doing is we're we're rallying Bitcoin higher going into this approval, which is mean we're, means we're factoring in that news. And so what's interesting here is you'll probably get approval by year end or early in 2024. If Bitcoin is still up here, you may not go higher. It may be already factoring in the approval. And that's, again, what we're seeing in the charts right here. So would that be a buy on the rumor or sell on the news or would that be buy on the rumor, stay steady on the news? So in, in general, it's very possible it could be a sell on the news. And, and depending on how high we go, uh, I just draw everyone's attention to NVIDIA last quarter, right? Last quarter, NVIDIA going into earnings was $400. It rallied up and on earnings, it opened at 500 and change, and then it sold back down to 400. So you have this kind of tendency for psychology within markets and investors where they start to get excited about news and they start buying and buying and buying. But once the news comes, there's kind of this natural letdown. And that's that's again what we could be seeing on Bitcoin here. So what level would we hit resistance if there is approval? Where do you see Bitcoin going and where do you see it hitting resistance on news of a spot Bitcoin ETF being approved? Yeah, so so let's just say that that it does jump, and I think initially you'll see this positive reaction, this kind of momentum trade jumping in. I would take this high from 2019 and connect it through the bull market lows, and there's this beautiful trend line. You can see how it connects right through these lows perfectly and right through these lows, and that gives us around a target potentially. This would be my max upside of about forty seven thousand dollars. But again, what I would be doing there is I'd be looking for it to fade that and actually expecting a bigger pullback off that level. So what level? 37? 47. 47, 47. Would be max upside, max upside. For, even with the halving expected in April, because you could have a spot Bitcoin ETF combined with, you know, halving anticipation, halving news. Does yeah. that change the, the sell on the news or stay steady on the news part of the equation? 
It doesn't to me. The having is a great like fundamental factor within Bitcoin that that is important over the longer term. But if you get such a run up on this news, like let's say on the spot ETF where it pops up immediately, I think it doesn't matter about the having. You'll still see a pullback uh, on the charts. Right. OK. Um, and you do expect approval by the beginning of next year. I mean, it's yeah. d differing I views. JP Morgan saying by January of next year, others saying perhaps even by the end of the year. What does what does Gareth Soloway say when he looks into his tea leaves? <laughs> I, I think it's right in, along with those lines, either late this year or early in January of next year. It's coming. Uh, the SEC has lost every major case against crypto. Um, and so they really don't have a leg to stand on to, to say no anymore, especially with Grayscale. So I do expect the approval. And I think it'll be the approval of many ETFs at once. I don't think the SEC wants to look and say, oh, they only approve BlackRock because that's, you know, part of the, you know, people say like BlackRock's part of the government or they're, they're in cahoots with the government. So I think they don't want to portray that. So they'll probably approve multiple ETFs at one time. And that wouldn't be enough to propel it further, considering there would be so much more demand for those uh, spot Bitcoin ETFs to, to buy Bitcoin. Yeah, so I, I don't think so. I think, again, price is, is the predominant factor here. And if you get to these levels or as high as 47,000, there will be people that got caught in the in the bear market decline that were even buying as high as the 40s, 50s, and 60s in Bitcoin back in 2021. And they will be happy to get their money back and they will cash out. And I also think that a lot of these institutions that have ETFs have probably been accumulating for the last couple months, knowing that eventually approval will come. And so there may not be as many buyers for the spot. ETF um, as you think. Okay. So 47,000 is where news of this spot Bitcoin ETF could potentially take us in terms of, of a top there. Look, I know you're very, very long term, very bullish on Bitcoin. And we'll, we'll get into that. But last time you were on, you said you did see a significant pullback for Bitcoin as quite likely. Two months ago, you said Bitcoin can go down to $15,000. Mm -hmm. um, on, on, on the basis of that was that we'd see an overall market decline. That was the reasoning behind that call, yeah. correct? That's so correct. Are, there, are those factors still at play then? What, what scenario could bring Bitcoin down again? What happened to that call? Yeah, so that, that's still on the table. Although, again, you have to you have to say that the action in Bitcoin has been tremendous right now. What I'm curious is once we get this news out that that the spot has been approved and that news is behind us, what's the next narrative to drive price? Is it the having? Does that play into effect? And then ultimately, what happens if the stock market goes down 35 percent, like I've been talking about? At some point. Fear and panic will take over, even in Bitcoin holders. Remember, there's a lot of people that hold Bitcoin, like myself, that also have big stock portfolios. And if at some point I'm down huge, do I start to panic and start selling everything? And I think that's the worry that could drive us back to 15 or even lower if we get really in a bad space within the overall asset markets. Do you have a new support level that you're calling for Bitcoin under two scenarios, one scenario Assuming that we do get into this recession and everything else, you know, geopolitically stays the same, we do get into the recession, we do get a spot Bitcoin ETF approval, but markets are down and signs of recession are factoring in, and we see the Fed pause, maybe do that mercy cut. Under what in, in, in that scenario, what would your, be your Bitcoin support level? Yeah, so so we have to just let the charts speak for themselves. And if we look at the Bitcoin chart, we've broken above this previous high right here, right? This was right around 31,500. So as a technician, I have to respect that. And that level now becomes support. So if we pull back, that's actually a buyable level now around 31,500, give or take. However, it would be very, very concerning if we started trading back below that. So this level is almost now the line in the sand on a bull case. You have to hold this level. If you start trading below the 30,000 level, for instance, you then start bringing into account maybe going back to 25. If 25 breaks, maybe going down to 20 and then to that 15.7 low. So right now, the buyable level is, is 31.5. Let's see if that holds on any sort of retrace. We've spoken in the past and you've never gone lower than I think a Bitcoin drop to 9,000. I think no. that, I mean, and, and obviously factors have changed, but is, is there an ultimate support level that you are pretty comfortable that even with all hell breaking loose, more or less, short of a major Armageddon, Bitcoin maintains that level? 
Yeah, I am kind of in that. I mean, let's say let's say we really get in a bad space within the equity markets and everything else. I do think that there is ultimate demand for Bitcoin. I think the digital gold aspect of Bitcoin is slowly being adopted more and more. It's in in its infancy at this point. But I do think that if you look at Max Payne, where the most people would be washed out, where bottoms are created, I do think that that would be right at that ten thousand even number. And I would be buying like crazy if we got down to those levels again. And I do think again now that you're seeing people like. Like, like BlackRock CEO starting to talk so positively about it. Granted, they're talking their book. May you know we have to be recognizing that since they're bringing this ETF to to market. But I do think that the big money out there is starting to accept Bitcoin, and that's the beginning of it becoming its own asset, uh, just like gold. Okay, now you did have some interesting swing trade moves because I know you're bullish very long term on Bitcoin, but you yourself are a technical analyst. You are a swing trader. Talk us through some of the recent Bitcoin moves that you've had. Yeah. So so one of the things that I did recently, and I'll just go over some of the trades in, in, in my service that I've given out and done with my members, is there was a trend line here, right? So if you look at the high of Bitcoin, which was this happened to be when the, the Ripple news hit, right here. And then we started to sell off from that point. By the way, that's a good example of sell the news event. The Ripple news came out and then we actually ended up selling off. So you see how trend this trend line kind of gets tagged multiple times. Once we broke out above it, I went long Bitcoin for a move up. Now, once we hit 31,000, this resistance, I sold half the position. And then once we hit 34,000 here, I sold the other half. I then flipped it into a short at 35,175. And I'm now riding it on the short side, anticipating anticipating a retrace to this 31.5-ish level. So so again, and just for everyone watching, remember, I'm a trader, I'm a swing trader. So this is kind of my bread and butter, these smaller moves. But again, that is the way I'm trading it and have been trading it. And for those that have a more long-term outlook that don't want to participate in the daily trades, that want to just buy and, and hold, give us some guidance there. So if you're someone who just is not going to look at Bitcoin for the next 10 years, then honestly, anywhere in this range, I think is good. I do think it's a north of 100,000 within three years. Um, I do think, again, it has much more higher levels that it can achieve as well. So uh, obviously, entry is nice to get. So I would say if it pulls back to this 32 to 31.5 level, that's where your accumulation zone. But again, the key is always don't invest more than you're willing to lose. You just never know about any asset out there. So just be careful. But you're quite comfortable with Bitcoin at 100,000 in the next three years. That seems pretty conservative by most people's standards. That's true. If you talk to a lot of Bitcoiners and, and maxis, they're telling you a million dollars. I mean, I think I'm more realistic, you know, looking at the market cap of gold and how Bitcoin is slowly growing into that. I think down the line it matches gold, but I don't think in the next three years uh, it probably gets to those levels just yet. So so I think 100,000, give or take. Um, if we just want to talk about maybe that next level, I'll just show you guys this chart here. Um, this is our weekly. So let's zoom out on our weekly. And if you want to just find a trend line that kind of tells you, simply take a trend line from the last bull market high to these bull market highs in 2021. And then if we kind of zoom out, we can see where that level is. And again, if we extend that out and just keep on running, 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 you can see it's starting to approach $100,000. So again, that would kind of be the ankle or the, the, the angle that I'd be looking for that next target to be. How does Bitcoin react to more liquidity in the markets, to a panicked Fed that cuts rates and maybe has to even inject more, more quantitative easing. So I think the key is going to be this, is that longer term, the more money in the system, the better for Bitcoin, the better for gold, all of those assets that are kind of anti-inflation or go or, or do well under inflationary circumstances. But I do think that if the Fed gets in a pickle and you see all assets collapsing and they're cutting rates because it's, it's a mess, it's Armageddon in the economy, then you could see that sell-off occurring at the same time. Remember with COVID, when COVID hit in March of 2020, gold sold off and Bitcoin sold off. So you have to remember that panic is panic. It's the biggest emotion we have. It's the most, the craziest, the most intense. And that if we did have that scenario, you could still see Bitcoin dip on that news. All right, let's talk about panic because you can't really not take a look at these escalating geopolitical tensions. And gold has been moving on the Fed likely to cut and also in its role as a safe haven play. And Bitcoin is supposed to be a safe haven play. And Gareth, we could have spillover in the conflict in the Middle East between Israel and Hamas. I mean, we've seen the U.S. 
posturing. There have been, we're learning, 14 separate assaults on U.S. forces in the past week in the Middle East involving drones and rockets, yeah. leading to 24 reported injuries. That's according to the Pentagon. Uh, we're also learning that U.S. personnel in Iraq were targeted 11 times during this recent time frame of October 17th to 24th. Forces in Syria apparently experiencing some attacks. And uh, the U.S. military is now taking steps to protect its troops in the Middle East, increasing U.S. military patrols, restricting access to base facilities, stepping up intelligence collection, so forth and so on. Mm. We are very much still in a situation where we could have big conflict spillover. We're still waiting for the Israeli Defense Forces to potentially go into a ground operation into Gaza to take those hostages kidnapped by Hamas. There's still concern that Hezbollah in the north jumps into the fray. It, it seems to have calmed down somewhat, but we're learning about U.S. bolstering its presence in the region. It, it still could ignite very, very quickly. And again, I'm not asking you to give me your sort of geopolitical military analysis of how you're seeing this playing out, but should there be some, oh, you're welcome to though, but should there be some kind of flare up? I mean, yeah. is, this, is this where we see a, a safe haven test for, for Bitcoin? Yeah, I mean, I think that's definitely some of it. And I think the recent run in gold is also part of it. So we can touch on gold first. And I, I think that's important to look at in terms of the chart here. And, and gold just continues to be an outstanding asset. And what I mean by that is if you look at where gold is trading, we're basically $100 below all-time highs. But then if you flip over to the Dixie, the dollar, and you see the run that the dollar has had since July, it is remarkable that gold has held up as well as it has. Now, if you think about it, one thing that I've seen and I've seen records of this or, or news reports of this is that central banks have been loading the boat on gold. And again, you know, it, it's always about listening to the smarter money. And they're the ones that literally see the, the dollars and cents being printed and they're the ones printing it. If they're loading the boat on gold, then it probably says we need to do the same. And look at this recent move. So many people were panicked in this gold decline here when we had nine consecutive down days. And then the move up eclipsed that by a mile here. Next to that, you also have had very bullish consolidation. To me, this is a bull flag forming, which is likely going to bring our next move up to test the all-time high. So at least in gold perspective, this is a great chart. It continues to look like a chart that's going to break out either by year end or early 2024. And I think, again, we're talking you know at least the potential for twenty four to twenty five hundred dollar gold in twenty twenty four, and just to show you how I get that calculation, I want to just show you guys real quick. There's an inverse head and shoulders here, so this is a technical pattern and technical analysis, and essentially you can calculate that out. And basically, if we break this high, what you do here, and this is pretty cool to see. You take the lowest point of the head, a plumb line or a straight shot right up, $467. And if we take this down and we take that breakout, $467 higher, where do we go? We go basically to $2,500. So again, I think that that's once we break this triple top, that's where we're headed, about $2,500 uh, per ounce in gold. And that's even if there is not an escalation in this crisis, which we're certainly hoping that there isn't. Yeah. yeah, let's hope there's not, but you're right. That's that's regardless, that has more to do with domestic situations. For instance, the inflation, for instance, the, uh, the, 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 the idea that we will see a recession, that the Fed eventually will be forced to make monetary policy easier, which then keeps inflation higher for longer. And ultimately that is a benefit to gold. So again, you know, when you have the US debt trading where it is or where it is at this point, 33.4 or 5 trillion or close to 34, there's no way to pay off that debt without printing money, unfortunately. And so that's just the end game of this. And I think smart money is going towards gold. And I also think to some extent it's starting to accumulate Bitcoin. Right. And again, that's just on the narrative of dollar debasement, dollar de right. devaluation, US debt spiral, high inflation, Fed going back to printing. Is gold then sufficiently pricing in these geopolitical tensions. We saw a minor pop, but is that even really priced into gold yet? It's hard to know, right? I mean, it's hard to know which ones are taking the forefront. I mean, I think if it were to be a World War III scenario, there's no doubt it's not pricing in that. Um, if it's more of a localized conflict in the Middle East, I think it might be pseudo pricing that in. But again, it's one of those things that you don't really know. The only thing you can go by is the chart action, and the chart action remains very, very bullish. Are we getting signs of Bitcoin being seen 
as a safe haven. People like to call it a digital gold, gold store value and safe haven. Is there any, I mean, we know that the charts have been moving on the spot Bitcoin ETF, but is there any indication that Bitcoin is starting to take on the safe haven role? Or, or do we only know that if there is uh, an escalating crisis and we see how Bitcoin responds? So I think there are small signs that it is. I think it's a slow process where more and more people adopt that as a safety hedge, right? So right now there's not enough a widespread kind of adoption to make Bitcoin that safety hedge. But I do think that you could say that, okay, so is the recent run, I mean, if we look at the chart here, this recent run in gold has been a tremendous move to the upside. And it almost in a weird way, you know, lagging indicator here, look at the move on Bitcoin. Now it's tricky with Bitcoin because you have the anticipation of the spot ETF. So was it the safe haven of gold move that drew Bitcoin up or is it the spot ETF? Or maybe just maybe it's a combination of them both. I think it's probably a combination of both. All right. Uh, we want to touch on oil very quickly as well then, because oil also linked to this crisis should things escalate. We do know that 20 percent of the world's oil supply goes through the Strait of Hormuz, which Iran has in the past tried to block. So even if there are skirmishes in the region, that could be very problematic for oil supply at the very least. And oil, as we know, a critical factor of inflation. Talk us through the oil trade then. Yeah, so the oil trade is fascinating because, again, if we look at when Hamas staged that horrendous attack on Israel, right, you had this pop in oil, right? And since then, even with the risk that Lebanon gets drawn in and, 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 and you know, all of these different countries, Iran and everything like that, oil is actually net neutral from that news. And to me, that's a really big indicator. It's something that I look for. It's like, it's like when you see really bullish news for oil and oil's not ripping higher, that tells you which way it's ultimately going to go. And then you have this nice head and shoulders pattern, which hasn't triggered yet. But if we get below this 83 level, I see oil going down into the mid 70s or even potentially low 70s. So I'm not seeing this narrative that says oil's going to 100 or 120 or even higher. I see actually oil starting to drop. And it almost makes sense. Like, let's say, all right, so number one, the US is producing almost enough oil at this point to be energy independent. So number two is that if you go to the extent of saying, is the economy slowing? Are we going to go into a recession? So far, it's been soft landing or no landing at all. If that's changing, then oil has a long way to the downside to go. All right. So more pulled down by recession than geopolitical risks and factors and, and supply chain situation. That's correct. That's correct. All right. I, I do want to point out again to our viewers that you are a day trader. Technical analysis is your bread and butter, and people can check out what you do on your daily game plan in terms of swing trades. But in terms of long-term calls, you did correctly call for Bitcoin to reach a high of 69000 in November of 2021, which it did, and you called that well in advance. You also correctly said in October of 2021 that gold would perform better than Bitcoin in 2022, another forecast that turned out to be correct. So going to put you on the spot now, Gareth, what is your biggest point of conviction of where we are? What data point can you give me today that if I talk to you in a year's time, I can say you were correct or incorrect on that? All right. Well, let's let's go for it. So I'll say this. I, I think oil trades to $50 within the next year or so. So I think oil down to $50 uh, by the end of 2024. Um, I think that gold breaks out above the all-time highs and tests 2,500 by the end of next year. And I also think that the NASDAQ and the S&P retest October lows by the end of next year. There's a bunch of them for you. <laughs> All right. Those are very bold predictions. And I always appreciate it when uh, guests come on and take a position and, and are very bold about it. So uh, thank you very much for that. We'll, we'll hold your feet to the fire and see how those turn out. Uh, but very quickly, uh, Gareth, tell our viewers where they can catch you daily and how they can get access to uh, the trading services that you provide. Absolutely. So I do a live show every morning, 9 a.m. on Monday through Friday called The Game Plan. I go over short-term technical analysis and trade setups. And then just come find me at inthemoneystocks.com or verifiedinvesting.com. Those are both websites where I cover stocks and crypto and all the good stuff in commodities. All right. So thank you so much, Gareth. We'll touch base with you again soon. Appreciate it as always. Thank you. Thank you. All right. And of course, a big thank you to our sponsors, Swan Bitcoin. There is a product that Swan has. It's the Swan IRA product, and it allows you to invest in Bitcoin with your IRA. You can set it up to buy Bitcoin practically on autopilot. So 
takes advantage of dollar cost averaging there. There is a link in the description. The setup is free and there's an offer for Kidco viewers. So be sure to check that out as we see how the price of Bitcoin shapes up. And for me, Michelle McCory and the rest of the Kitco team, thank you so much for joining us. We'll see you again soon. On the Spot with Michelle McCory is brought to you by Swan Bitcoin. Swan Bitcoin IRA. Your legacy, your way. Real Bitcoin, not proxies. Traditional and Roth IRAs. Fast, easy setup. Start now at swan.com slash retire.